All right. Um, I have a statement to share with you on the uh, number of demonstrations that we've seen around the world. The Secretary General has been following closely the recent wave of street demonstrations that have been taking place in several countries around the world. He is deeply concerned that some of these protests have led to violence and regretfully, in some instances, have resulted in the loss of life and serious injuries. The Secretary General restates that freedom of expression and peaceful assembly are fundamental rights that must be respected. Upholding rights is one of the up, excuse me, upholding these rights is one of the bedrock of our society and is crucial for advancing democracy, development, and peace. The Secretary General reiterates his call for security forces to act at all times with maximum restraint and to respond to any acts of violence in conformity with relevant international human rights standards on the use of force by law enforcement officials. He also calls on protesters to demonstrate peacefully and to refrain from violence. As he stated in his address to the United Nations General Assembly last week, the Secretary General urges all states to safeguard civic space and to uphold human rights to help deliver on sustainable development and peace. Turning to Iraq, the Secretary General Special Representative in Iraq, Janine Hennish Plashkert, welcomed last night's address by Prime Minister Ad, uh, Adil Abdul Mahdi, which emphasized the need for unity, dialogue, and action. The Special Representative said there is an opportunity to move forward and that the interests of the country must be prioritized above all else. She said that dialogue must pave the way to understanding, reconciliation, and progress. Meanwhile, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights today called on the Iraqi government to allow for people to freely exercise their right of freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. The office said that the use of force should be exceptional and assembly should orderly be managed without resort to force. Any use of force must comply with applicable international human rights norms and standards, including the principles of necessity and proportionality, the Office of Human Rights said. A number of trip announcements for you. The Secretary General will leave New York on the evening of Wednesday, 9 October, to head to Copenhagen in Denmark. Building on the momentum generated by last month's Climate Action Summit, the Secretary General will take part in the C40 World Mayor Summit to show his support for the tremendous efforts undertaken by cities, more than 100 of which committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 at the UN Climate Summit in September. In Copenhagen, he will urge cities to continue enhancing resilience to climate change and accelerating transition to a green economy. The Secretary General will deliver the keynote address at the C40 plenary session on Friday, October 11th, on the theme, the future we want is inclusive and climate action must lift everyone up. While in the Danish capital, he will participate in a working lunch with the Foreign Policy Committee of the Danish Parliament on Thursday, the 10th of October. He will also hold bilateral meetings with Prime Minister uh, Fredriksen, and they will jointly visit a UNICEF warehouse where they will pack kits of humanitarian supplies. The Secretary General will visit UN City, an environmentally sustainable facility where he will take part in the official opening of the UN Refugee Agency World Bank Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement. This project aims to allow for decisions affecting refugees, internally displaced people, asylum seekers, and others to be made in a more timely and evidence-based manner. And on Friday, the Secretary General will have an audience with Her Majesty the Queen of Denmark. And tonight, the Deputy Secretary General will go to Geneva to attend uh, and deliver remarks at the 17th Annual Session of UNHCR's Executive Committee, as well as participate in the high-level seg segment on statelessness. She will also meet uh, UN officials while there, and she will be back in New York on the 7th of October. Meanwhile, the head of the the political and peacebuilding department, Rosemary DiCarlo, will visit the Middle East from the 5th to the 11th of October to discuss with key counterparts, partners, and current efforts by the UN mission, agencies, funds, and programs in the region. From the 5th to the 8th, she will meet with government officials and civil society organizations in Israel and Palestine and visit the Office of the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process in Jerusalem. On the 8th, uh, Ms. DiCarlo will go to Amman, where she will meet with Jordanian and UN officials. And she will be in Lebanon from the 9th to the 11th for talks with government officials, civil society organizations, including women's groups. During her three-day visit, she will also meet with the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon, the UN Country Team, and she will also visit the UNIFIL 
troops in southern Lebanon. And Mr. Lokok, the emergency relief coordinator, will visit three European countries, Sweden, Netherlands, and France. Between Monday and Wednesday next week, he will meet with the government officials in each of the countries to discuss issues related to humanitarian action. On Tuesdays in Amsterdam, he will also deliver a keynote address on international, at the International Conference on Mental Health and Psychosocial Support for Crisis Situations. I will be here, and I'm not traveling. Don't worry. Um, in other news, our colleagues in the Democratic Republic of the Congo are marking an important milestone today. The 1,000th person to survive Ebola after receiving treatment has now returned home. In a joint statement, David Greasley, who heads the emergency relief uh, operation in, um, for Ebola and the World Health Organization, the World Food Program, and UNICEF, as well as Save the Children, commended the strong leadership of the DRC health authorities and the tireless efforts of thousands of local health workers and partners. New treatments have improved survival rates of people infected with Ebola. According to a recent study, over 90% of people who receive treatment early enough during their illness can be saved. Vaccination has also protected over 225,000 people. And an update on Tunisia, where I can tell you that we are closely following the ongoing electoral process in the country. The UN commends Tunisia for the successful holding of the first round of presidential elections on the 15th of September and calls for peaceful and transparent elections to be held for the parliament on the 6th of October and the second round of the presidential elections on the 13th of October. The UN urges all concerned to ensure a level playing field for all candidates, including equality of chances in full respect for Tunisian law and the prerogatives of the judicial branch. We remind the authorities and candidates of their responsibility in ensuring peaceful elections and resolving any complaint through the constitutional process. Our humanitarian colleagues say that more than 90,000 people have been affected by floods caused by heavy rains and thunderstorms in Yemen since September 27th. Most of the affected people, 70 percent, are in Haja governorate. Humanitarian agencies have stepped up stepped in to provide initial assistance. Residential uh, areas, sites for displaced people, farms and water reservoirs have been damaged. Humanitarian agencies are undertaking a detailed assessment. Um, and today we welcome, uh, sorry, I uh, wanted to add just a musical note. Um, the UN Chamber Music Society will hold a concert for climate action on Tuesday, the 8th of October at the Whale uh, Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall. Uh, during the concert, uh, sorry, the Ural, we have details of the concert, uh, which is always uh, great music from our colleagues uh, available in my office. And lastly, we are now up to 128, thanks to Cameroon, which has paid its dues to the regular budget. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. On the announcement that you made um, from the Secretary General on protests, mm -hmm. could you tell us what specific countries the, the Secretary General was referring to? Look, we have seen uh, over the last months uh, demonstration in various parts of the world, whether uh, in Ecuador, in, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in South Africa, um, in Egypt. It, you know, and I, I'm just saying these off the top of my head in terms of what's been in the news, and they aren't, they aren't the only ones. I think uh, by f they're not the only ones by far, uh, but I think the Secretary General is concerned, as he said it in, uh, in his General uh, Assembly uh, speech, one on the, the, the shrinking civic space, and also, I think it bears reminding, as we have been doing here, of, um, of an important, uh, important principle of the right for people to assemble peacefully, to demonstrate peacefully, and for the use of proportionality uh, by law enforcement officers. James. Uh, so you've said that the general statement by the Secretary General among the places it applies is Hong Kong. Let me ask you a couple of questions about Hong Kong, if I can. The decision by the Chief Executive Carrie Lam to invoke colonial-era emergency powers and ban 
face mask? Does the UN believe that uh, is an appropriate measure? What is your reaction to the fact that in the last few minutes we have news that a 14-year-old boy has been shot in the thigh, again, live ammunition being used, the Hong Kong police acting uh, in a heavy-handed manner? And my last question, what is the UN's involvement what do you have on the ground? Do you have anyone there who is observing from the human rights no, office? I'm, I'm or anyone? not aware of and, that. And, and what interaction has there been um, b by any UN official with the Chinese about their conduct? Uh, I'm not aware of us having any presence uh, in Hong Kong. I haven't, see, I haven't seen the reports that you you mention on on the demonstrators, but I think again I would refer you to our principled position on the, on the use of force, uh, and I have no specific comment on the law enacted by Carrie Lam. And so, what about the interaction between anyone, Secretary General, mm -hmm. um, Under Secretary General uh, De Carlo, any other UN official who has been in touch with the Chinese to pass on your message about restraint and I think uh, message. Uh, Discussions have been had at uh, at various levels, and our message is our, our message publicly to all member states is exactly what I've read out. There is no there is no secret message being passed to one specific mm -hmm. member state. This is our general principled message. Masood and then Carla and then Alan. And then, go ahead. Mr. Pan, uh, follow up on the protest. Um, the Secretary General has, has said that he supports he has the right of people to protest peacefully and all that. What about the Kashmiris, 8 million Kashmiris who are incarcerated and who are not allowed to even come out of their houses for food, even for food, collecting food, partial lifting. So what about them? them? What does the Secretary General say about we, the, we, our, our, our message the, on Kashmir has, has not changed, as the situation on the ground has not changed. So I would refer you to where we've We've already said, expressing our concern, encouraging dialogue, and saying that the situation in Kashmir, if it's going to be solved politically, needs to uh, have uh, human rights at its at its center. Our, our position is unchanged on this. But sir, it's it's too much. I I, I I understand it's your I, I understand outrageous. your question. I'm just saying our position is unchanged. Carla, oh, sorry, and yeah. then I'll, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Ish, go ahead, but please use the microphone, if the car. Sir, the UN humanitarian agencies have an excellent record of providing relief to people under distress. Mm -hmm. Why haven't they gone into Kashmir to provide medicine, to other relief items, and, uh, and visit prisoners? I believe, my understanding, and you'll have to check with UNICEF, but I think UNICEF does have a presence there. Um, Carla and then Alan. Um, as you know, last Friday, the vice president of, I think it was last Friday, of Venezuela, Delcy Rodriguez, had a press conference, and uh, a number of us asked questions. I did as well, and um, it was brought to my attention that the English translation of the conference, a lot of which was in Spanish, um, was entirely in English, with the exception of my own question, which I asked in English and was only uh, available in Spanish on the English translation. So my question is, is this really incompetence or is this a de facto form of censorship? Because I, I, I would... I, Carla, I, I'm hearing your words. I really don't understand the question. The interpreter, well, the question, our interpreters here do an excellent job. Right. Well, From what I saw, they when people speak Spanish, they interpret into English. If it's a Spanish language press conference, the, the, your your question asked in English is interpreted into Spanish. There's also there's also a floor. Uh, you could also <laughs> listen to the floor where you can listen in both languages. Well, I suggest then you look at the English version of that. A uh, press conference, all of which is in English, except for my own question, which was asked in English, which was only available in Spanish. I, I, I will look into it, but I, I don't really understand. Alan? I don't either. Well, it makes two of us. Thank you, Steph. Uh, yesterday, uh, Russian DPR informed about some new uh, developments uh, regarding the visa, visas uh, mm -hmm. issues. So according to that, uh, some part of Russian delegates which were going, who were going to 
participate in the work of first committee uh, didn't receive visas from the US. Uh, and uh, yesterday you've said that uh, the UN is in contact with uh, host country uh, on the visas problem. So I just wanted to ask you whether, uh, is there any updates? Um, I mean, how's, how the, those negotiations are going now? And uh, are there any changes? No, as, as we said yesterday, we have uh, been officially notified by the Russian Federation. We are actively engaging with them as well as with the host country uh, authorities. And I do know that uh, the issue was discussed in the host country committee as well. Just to follow up, uh, Russian DPR uh, proposed to uh, move the sessions uh, of the first committee in 2020 somewhere, but not uh, not them to host in U.S., maybe to Vienna or Geneva. What's the stance, the, stance the, the, of the, the, the SG on the, mem this? the member states uh, are, can decide where to hold uh, a meeting. It is not for the secretariat to decide. So, Madam. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I wanted to ask, I know during the General Assembly, the Colombian president um, presented evidence that said that mm -hmm. Maduro was harboring Colombian rebels. And it was just found out a couple of days ago that the intelligence chief for Colombia, um, Oswaldo Peña, he just resigned mm -hmm. saying that they found out information that the evidence was faulty and actually mm -hmm. was created within Colombia. Um, does the secretary general have a statement for that? And on top of that, like with the follow-up from the issue on the visas, we know that Maduro is banned from entering the U.S. and so he didn't attend the General Assembly. Um, I was wondering... Does the UN have any comments as far as, even if he's banned from U.S. territory, the UN is neutral, and because the U.S. is the host country, okay. is so, it possible uh, for them to ban him? Your, on your first question, yes. the Secretary General was indeed given a, this report by the Colombian authorities. As to the content of the report and so on, that's a question delivered. You should ask the Colombian uh, permanent mission. On your second part, I'm not aware that Mr. Maduro was denied a visa to uh, come into the United States for the General Assembly. Now, there are, as, as a matter of principle, we know there are sanctions by the U.S. on, on certain people, and, and, but there is also the responsibility of the host country uh, to issue visas for people to attend U.N. Uh, meetings. Uh, we know, as I told that, as Alan asked, uh, there have some, been some uh, challenges this past uh, General Assembly, um, but that's a separate Thing. So I, I, I'm not sure I can really under, uh, answer your question in the way you'd like me to answer it. Sato-san. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yesterday you mentioned uh, the Secretary General uh, released the uh, uh, opinion editorial uh, regarding mm -hmm. uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me uh, he used a, a relatively stronger word than his usual. So was there any reaction uh, or response from the inside or outside well, United I'm, I'm Nations? Not, I, I'm hopefully, people appreciated the editorial. I'm not, I'm not aware of any letters of complaints, uh, but you may want to check the, rel uh, the relevant uh, media. The Secretary General used strong language because he believes very strongly uh, in this issue, and I think he, he strongly believes that what we saw, those who spoke up, during the climate summit showed leadership on this issue and this is about encouraging others whether it's in national governments subnational governments or private sector to also show courage and show leadership yes masood and then we'll go you yes, sir, sir on this uh, latest uh, uh, israelis firing into the uh, palace palestinians in gaza uh -huh, in which uh -huh. one palestinian was killed and several others wounded do you have any? Uh, no, I will check. That? I do not have an update on that. Thank you.